Hello, I'm Sarah Clark. And I'm Joel Arpins. Welcome to this edition of Your Family Pet. On tonight's show, we'll share some dog training techniques. You'll see how one woman takes care of her special needs dog. We'll offer tips on winter care for your pet and help you set up your first aquarium. All that and much more on this edition of Your Family Pet. Production funding for Your Family Pet is made possible in part by Memphis Veterinary Specialists, a referral-based specialty hospital serving the needs of small animals, offering diagnostic tools and treatment options not typically found outside veterinary teaching hospitals, including orthopedic and neurologic surgery, oncology, dermatology, dentistry, ophthalmology, internal medicine, and more. And by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. January is Train Your Dog Month, so naturally we felt the need to answer the age-old question. Can you teach an old dog new tricks? Sarah talks with professional dog trainer Anne-Marie Easton, who demonstrates some basic training techniques that you can employ with your dog, old or new. Anne-Marie, why is it important to train your dog at, at any age? Well, they're part of our family now. A lot of people view them as family members. And I think many people want them to be well-mannered in their home because they live in the home. When they have guests over for whatever, especially recently with the holidays, mm -hmm. it would be really nice if the dog didn't jump on the guests, right. didn't mug you for your food. So I think it's really important to find out what behaviors you want your dog to do in the home, mm -hmm. what's important to you in your lifestyle, and train them to do that. They'll be happier and you'll be happier. When's the earliest? You know, people say, I have a six-week puppy, I don't want to start training him yet. When's the earliest that you actually can start training your dog? So a few years ago, the American Veterinary Society of Animal Behaviorists mm -hmm. came up with a position statement for puppy classes, which is really important. Um, to prevent behavior issues, they strongly suggest taking a puppy to a puppy class before they've had all of their shots, which is a little against mm -hmm. what we normally think right. of. Um, when um, I teach a couple of puppy classes and talking with the vets, they have suggested that you have to have had, the puppy has had to have had their first set of shots okay. 10 days before the class and to have been in the home at least 10 days so you know that there's no illnesses. Right. So they could start as early as seven weeks. Wow. So say you adopt a dog that's older, maybe two or three years or even six or seven years old, can you teach a dog, an old dog, new tricks? Absolutely. Good. Absolutely. Good to know. Now who do we have here today with us? This is Bailey. So he's the dog that works with me in my business. He was adopted from the Humane Society ooh, eight plus years ago. Okay. So. And I see that you also have a little bag of tricks with you. Can you kind of go through what's in your bag here? So when I work with a dog, when I'm teaching a dog a behavior, I want to use a reinforcement that the dog really enjoys. Well, what better than food? And I also have a clicker. I mark behaviors that I want the dog to know you're right, and I want to repeat, I want him to repeat that behavior. Okay, so when you click, that means that they've done something correct. Absolutely, so okay. if I had had the clicker out, when his, as he was lowering his mm -hmm. back end to sit, I would have clicked to tell him, that's it, you're okay. right. Follow it with a reinforcement, the treats that I had in the bag. Okay. So, I'm gonna get my clicker and some treats. He's ready for it. Now, when the dog doesn't know, it's like a magnet to their nose. You come up, and as they're going into the sit, okay. I clicked and gave him the treat. I only want to do that three times. Okay. So then I become a very good actor. I pretend, and then it comes from my other hand or the bait bag. Okay. So that finally, you get the dog with a hand signal, and then you can click and treat. When the dog can reliably sit for the hand signal, mm -hmm. eight out of 10 times, you can start adding a verbal word, okay. like sit. Okay. You can also lure the down, just okay. to show you, because that's another behavior a lot of people like. Again, magnet to the nose, you come straight down, pull it forward, when their elbows hit the ground. So they almost have no choice. If they want it, that's mm -hmm. the way they have to go. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, I'm gonna pretend I have the treat, because remember, we don't want the food right. in our hands. So you come down. <laughs> Do you think that he would sit for me? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So I'm gonna give you the clicker. Okay. I tend to hold the clicker in my hand so that I can 
just press like this okay. so I can have treats here. Okay. And you'll notice that some of these are kind of big. That's okay. There you go. A lot bigger than my dog's treats. <laughs> <laughs> okay, come here, Bailey. So, all right, come over here. Sit. So at that point I click and give. Now, did I do that wrong? No, you were okay. right, but here's the thing. That's even a lure because the treat's in your hand. Okay. What you'd like to do, and what, what I saw that you did great. Yes, uh -huh. you're using a hand signal. Okay. Perfect, you clicked, perfect. You gave him his reinforcement, perfect. Now try without the treat in your hand. Okay, and, and just see. say it. And so you can say it okay. without the hand signal. So right. here's, here's a way to give him two signals. Okay. Sit, pause for a second to see if he will. Uh -huh. If not, then come with your hand okay. signal. Sit. Oh, you're good. Okay, well that's easy. Eventually, when you teach your dog to sit, you don't always have to have the clicker and treats. Okay. That wouldn't, I mean, who wants to walk around with right. that all the time? <laughs> so you can tell him, Bailey, sit. <gasps> what a good boy you are, that was excellent, that was and so good. And reward him with love. Yes. Okay. Petting, praising, talking to the dog, throwing a ball, if that's what they like. I still pay them every now and then, okay. doesn't hurt keeps that behavior going, yay, I, I want right. to do that. So I think another important one that I would like to discuss is the stay. Um, whether you're outside, inside, you have people over. My dog gets distracted by a butterfly Good outside. One. So really teach them how to stay so they're not running out in the road or Absolutely. something like that. So I'm going to borrow your clicker. Yep. Come here, Bailey. So I start very close. Sit down. Good boy. So I'm going to give him a hand signal, okay. stay. And I'm going to immediately click and treat okay. because I want to have a high rate of reinforcement. I want him to know that's what I want you to do. Right. So he's still staying. Okay. Now, if he were a dog who didn't know how to stay, I would have a faster rate of reinforcement. Okay. It literally would be as quick as I could click or say good and give him and a give treat. Okay. okay. So this way he's learning to stay okay. in place. Once he can do this, for 30 seconds between a marker, mm -hmm. like the click or good, and the treat, then I start moving back. Backing up, okay. Well, I can't wait to go home and try some of these on my dog, and thank you again for being here today. Oh, you're welcome. So, thank you for having me. Come here, Bailey. Come here. Oh, good boy. In past episodes of this show, we've highlighted the importance of service animals and the role they fill in our society. And we've just seen how simple it can be to train your dog but what about those animals who have special needs? Some pet owners might feel they are in unfamiliar territory trying to take care of them. Pierre Kimsey reports on a Memphis woman who, for her special needs dog, turned out to be a perfect match. There is only so much vegging out in front of the TV that Flash the dog can do before he begins to feel the call of the great outdoors. Yeah, this is his happy place, and there's not much out there that really makes him unhinged, except for one thing. A squirrel. You're not going to go squirrel hunting right now. Hi. <laughs> yep, and the, actually the ride the roo that is going around Cooper Young in Overton, um, he does not like that kangaroo on top of that van. Oh, really? Oh. <laughs> it kind of freaks him out a little bit. Mary Beth McGavin has become pretty attuned to the slightest change in Flash's behavior. In fact, you can argue it's almost second nature to her. I work at Weaver Elementary in West Memphis, Arkansas. I'm a self-contained special ed teacher and I have students, um, my classrooms for students in grades kindergarten through third grade. So the slightest sign of any special needs won't go unnoticed by Mary Beth, even if the rest of us have to look just a little bit closer. He's much more visually aware, which I think is typical of a deaf animal. Since I did my degree in special ed from the beginning, I learned about using modified signs or um, signed English. So between his visual acuity and her knowledge of sign language, it was time to open up a new line of communication. Things like going in his crate and time for bed and some directional signs like going outside or asking him to move. He pays attention to where I point, which in, in ASL is often directional. I said, go in your crate. So where the sign for sit is usually two-handed, I modified it to be one-handed so I can do this and ask, be asking him to sit while I'm feeding him a treat if he complies. Sit. Good boy. Uh, how much of a vocabulary does Flash have? I, the sit, lay down, go in your crate, time for bed, go outside. 
Um, I think he has eat and water, um, treat. Uh, so it's, it's growing. Not only that, the whole experience has made Mary Beth feel that she's getting a lot better at sign language. I, well, I wouldn't call myself fluent or an interpreter by any means. I, I can usually hold a decent conversation. As for Flash, this pit bull terrier couldn't be happier. Spending his days doing all the things he loves, like chewing on his favorite bone and getting some cuddles in on the side. Oh, and did I mention that he likes making new friends? So on an average day, you'll probably find Flash embarking on a new adventure with his mom or using his other heightened senses to spot those squirrels. Uh, yep, squirrel in the tree. There are squirrels everywhere. Your life is hard. <laughs> Your life is so hard. I know. For Family Pet, oh. I'm Pierre Kimsey. Yeah. <laughs> Our breed of the month earned its name through hard work. The Bulldog was originally bred as a cross between a pug and a mastiff, and it was trained to fight bulls for sport in England and throughout Europe in the 13th century, a practice that continued until the mid-1800s. The Bulldog's low-slung, heavy body enabled it to crawl close to the ground, thereby avoiding a charging bull's horns. And the prominent features of the modern Bulldog stem from the strongest survivors of the bullfights being chosen to perfect the breed. But don't let the Bulldog's fighting past deceive you. It's an obedient, devoted, and patient companion. It makes a wonderful family dog because it's always eager to please and affectionate, yet maintains its independent and stubborn qualities. Bulldogs are pleasant toward strangers, but can exhibit hostility toward unfamiliar dogs. However, Bulldogs also tend to be compatible with other household pets. We all recognize bulldogs by their distinctive undershot bite and scrunched up nose. Their bodies are heavy and thick, giving them a loose jointed shuffling gait. But don't be mistaken, bulldogs have surprising agility with the ability to move swiftly and make sudden leaps. Bulldogs have a glossy and fine coat in colors of red, white, or yellow, or sometimes a combination of the three. Their coat requires minimal care, but the facial wrinkles and folds near the tail should be cleaned often to avoid infection of the skin and skin fold dermatitis. Many often wheeze and snore, while others tend to drool due to their protruding lower jaw and short snout. A special concern in this part of the country is their tendency toward overheating. Bulldogs are not able to cool themselves as efficiently as other breeds do through panting. The average lifespan of a bulldog is between 8 and 12 years. All in all, this once ferocious dog has grown to become a highly affectionate family pet. The cold winter months present unique challenges for pet owners. Even though your dog or cat is wearing a fur coat, that doesn't mean they don't need your help and attention surviving the cold winter days. Joe chats with veterinarian Dr. Stephen Ambrose to find out how to protect our furry family members when the temperature drops. People think that just because pets, like cats and dogs, have fur coats, they've got to be warm. But that's not the case, is it? No, not at all. And, and the biggest thing is the temperatures, how they change uh, here. Uh, and get below freezing, both cats and dogs can have problems, especially here it's so damp and cold. Um, it can really affect them and affect them quicker than you think. Well, let's, let's focus on cats. I, and I'll tell people, I, I'm a dog person, but right. cats have a particular thing that they do which causes a great amount of consternation for an automobile owner and doesn't do much for the, the cat. Those cats crawl up on that engine block because it's warm and that heat stays there a long time and it's out of the wind too. Most, most of the time it's in a carport, that's out of the wind and then that motor's been hot, it holds that heat and that cat may wake up but not come out of there until it knows where you're at, especially if it's a stray. So making noise to go ahead and get them off because they may be right there on that belt waiting to see what you're going to do, they don't know you're going to start so the car. So when you come out to your vehicle you should do, I mean, yeah, just kind of hit, mm -hmm, hit the hood, hit the side um, as you go down the door. And that way that lets them know that you're not going anywhere and you're kind of moving down the car. Because as you move down the car, then they'll usually go ahead and skirt out. Let's shift gears to dogs. My wife is always concerned when the temperature really drops down, 
well, it may be too cold to take the pups for a walk. Right. And can it be too cold to take your dog, house dogs, yes. mind you, uh, for a walk? Yes, it depends. And, and a lot of that depends on the nature of the dog as far as, you know, the breed um, and what they're used for. For example, if you've got a hunting dog that's a lab that's used to the cold and he's been out working and you've been working him, he's gonna be ready to go for a walk. But if you have some of the smaller dogs like the Yorkies and Shih Tzus and things like that, those dogs tend to be inside and when it gets to be freezing outside, they usually wanna go do their business and come back in. If there's not a lot of moisture um, and it's kind of dry and cold, then they can be out a little while, just like we can. Um, you just wanna make sure you don't go for extended times. And if they get wet for any reason, say you're at the park, a lot of people go to Shelby Farms, and those dogs happen to go out on the ice. I don't don't let them go out there because if they can fall through just like we can. But if there's an open spot and they do, when they come out, you need to get them dry because they will get hypothermia just like we do. Well, not all dogs and cats are lucky enough to have inside homes. What should you do to make sure that they're able to stay warm, that they need to be out of the wind? What kind of yes. straw do they need to have a heat source? Yes, um, it, here um, it kind of depends on how cold it does get, but the biggest thing is they need to be dry and they need to be out of the wind. Um, and then as far as their dog house inside, you can use straw or some sort of bedding. Uh, some dogs will use blankets and stuff as long as they don't shred them and eat them and tear them up. If it starts to, to, drip, to get a lot colder, then you can actually put a heat source in there and usually like a, a 60 watt bulb. Um, just or hang something. a bulb in there? You can just put it in there, but you want to, I usually encourage you to put a screen above it because some dogs are curious and they go, hmm, I'm gonna chew on that. that so, looks like a ball. Exactly, so you want that and then I usually, We'll put something so that it deflects so the light's not directly on the dog. But that, that ball, believe it or not, in an, in, in an enclosed area will produce heat and then they're out of the wind and their heat as they curl up will give them the heat that they need to protect them, especially when temperatures, you know, get really low. We're talking about mm -hmm. dogs, but I guess really Cats goes. are the same way. Uh, a lot of cats um, like to be up. So a lot of times if up you- Up in. Up on something. So if you have a garage or a porch or something, a lot of times you can fix them a box up on a table or something because that gives them more security because they like to be able to see something coming up on them. Um, and what you can typically do is give them a box. They love towels um, or blankets because then they can get in there and, and curl up in that. Um, you can still do a heat source if you have, you know, a nice cat house for them to put in there. Um, but again, out of the wind and something that they can snuggle up in um, to get warm. Um, One last thing, uh, walking a pet and it's kind of slushy, mm -hmm. icy, these de-icers have been put on the roads. Do you need to give your, your pet a bath when you get back or just rinse their feet off? Yes, or what? you definitely need to wash their feet off. I mean, uh, spraying um, water or just wipe them off with a towel? I usually will recommend a little water. Usually most pets are used like that, are used to having their feet wiped. So usually what I'll do is say before you go, have some warm water, just set it, set it there, go for your walk. And when you come in, usually you can just dip their foot in it and wipe them off, dry it, and dip their, because they're used to having that done because most of them expect to get their feet wiped off, you know, if they're wet. But they that's, do in our household. <laughs> exactly, so that's the biggest thing. And then, you know, I can't say enough about antifreeze this time of year, if you, if you think your dog, cat or dog, got into it, you need to take them to the vet because you, if you catch it soon enough, and there is a test to actually test them for to see if they've been exposed to it, you can treat them and they do have a pretty good outcome. Well, Dr. Stephen Ambrose, I appreciate your time. Thank and you, Joe. we've got some, some pets that are gonna probably much, be much happier and much warmer yes. and safer, thanks to you. Thank you. Did you know that watching fish in an aquarium can lower blood pressure and reduce stress and anxiety? Well, that's just one of the benefits of this colorful hobby. Sarah talks with Richard Rendos of Menfish about the ABCs of starting a fresh or saltwater aquarium. So Richard, obviously when you think about the two, saltwater tanks versus freshwater tanks, we mm -hmm. know the big difference there. What are some other significant differences about the two? Um, cost, definitely. The freshwater fish are gonna be less expensive. They're actually usually hardier because um, they come from farms. Most of them are tank raised or farm raised. So they're already used to aquarium conditions, aquarium foods, 
They're pretty much parasite or disease free. Um, saltwater fish come from the ocean. So, I mean, they're right out of the ocean. You've got a diver in Indonesia or wherever in the world that he's collecting his fish, and he's diving down, collecting fish by hand in a net, which can't be an easy feat, I mean. No, not at all, <laughs> which explains why they're so much more expensive than exactly, freshwater fish. Exactly, you got a guy with no tanks, he just dives down holding his breath with a net wow. and collects the fish that someone ordered that week. Wow. Um, then you've got shipping involved. Uh -huh. um, they have to package up and ship those fish from those kind of distances, mm -hmm. which can take you know, 24 to 48 hours in a bag. You've got the shipping right. costs and everything. Right. Um, so, I mean, yeah, the saltwater fish are definitely more expensive, but to me, when you compare the beauty and the color of what's mm -hmm. available in saltwater versus freshwater, it's, it's worth the money. Okay. <laughs> Talk about setup. Which one's harder to set up, maybe more costly to set up? Um, I don't know that either one is harder to set up, but definitely saltwater is more costly. The filtration is a little bit more involved than freshwater. Um, lighting can be quite a bit more advanced in, in saltwater than it mm -hmm. is in freshwater. Uh, freshwater, most people know you have an aquarium, you have gravel, a little filter on the back, right. and a light. Right. That's pretty much it. Saltwater, you've got live rock, you've got live corals, you've got lighting that can be mm -hmm. thousands of dollars, aquarium controllers to control your aquarium while you're out of town right. on vacation. So for somebody that's just starting out, a fish newbie, so to speak, would you recommend a freshwater tank then? Definitely. Okay. Just don't go to the fair <laughs> <laughs> and win um, a fish during the ring toss because those are usually not very healthy fish anyway. But yeah, freshwater, definitely more hardy and better for a less experienced hobbyist. Right. So speaking of the fair, maybe do some research then before you go definitely. out and get your fish. You always <laughs> want to research what you're going to get before okay. you actually get it instead of doing it in the reverse order. Right getting the thing and then finding out what have I gotten myself into right. and how much is this going to cost me. Right. Now talk about, say somebody started out and they're very experienced with freshwater mm -hmm. tanks. What about converting over to saltwater? Do you have any tips or advice on that? Um, you can either convert the existing tank. Okay. A lot of people come in and they ask, um, they see an empty tank mm -hmm. and they say, is that a saltwater tank? Well, it's just a box of glass. It can be either right. one. But if you're using existing things, pretty much you're going to empty out the old freshwater tank, bring your fish to the fish store to trade in, right. or find a friend who's got an aquarium to get rid of. You don't want to just flush them down the toilet. Right. Um, and then uh, everything's going to be different, but it works in a similar way. Instead okay. of just using gravel, you have to use sand from mm -hmm. the ocean. It helps with the water chemistry to keep the pH up in the aquarium. Um, switch your filters over. If you're going to keep live corals, invest in, the, in good lighting to help keep them mm -hmm. alive. Because if you don't, you put cheap lights over it, you buy expensive corals, right. they die, you've wasted your money. Okay. Um, usually using um, RODI water, which is reverse osmosis, it's mm -hmm. a purified water, is a good idea because you don't get all the contaminants that are in our tap water. Right. If you are using tap water, you definitely want to use a dechlorinator or water conditioner okay. to get all those things neutralized so okay. it's safe for the fish. Um, but it's really not that bad. Okay. Temperatures are about the same. Most things are the same or similar. Mm -hmm. um, just a little bit, they work a little bit differently. Right. Talk about compatibility. I mean, what, like, like say somebody goes and gets a fish from the ocean, assuming <laughs> that you can do that, right. and puts it in with fish that they already have. How does that work? Um, fish that you already have are in a small environment. If they've come down with a disease or a parasite, you've already treated for that. So when you add a new fish, you're always taking a chance that it's bringing in something mm -hmm. from the ocean that those fish aren't used to having. Um, and it can contaminate just the one new fish that you brought in, or it could be something that spreads to your other fish and wipes right. out everything. So having a quarantine tank is actually a really good idea. Okay. Um, it's just a separate tank set up that you can uh, make sure the fish is eating well and everything before it's added to the main aquarium. Right. If it does come down with a disease, you can treat it separately before it gets added so that you're not contaminating your main aquarium. Okay. Now taking care of fish kind of seems like it's a hard job, but <laughs> say you have to leave and go out of town. You mentioned earlier there are mm -hmm. apps for that. There Talk are that. aquarium controllers that you can hook up to your aquarium and there are apps for your iPhone or whatever That's phone crazy. you have. Um, it can do everything from turning your lights on and off. If water evaporates, it can top off your aquarium so that, it, that you know the wow. aquarium doesn't run in the right. water. Um, there are automatic fish feeders. 
that you can hook up to those and touch of a button on your phone and your fish back home are getting fed. Makes life a lot easier. It does. <laughs> well, we appreciate having you on the show and thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks for having me. That's all for this edition of Your Family Pets. We hope you've enjoyed the show and we invite you to join us again in February. We'll have more stories about the joys of pet ownership. See you next time on Your Family Pets. Production funding for Your Family Pet is made possible in part by Memphis Veterinary Specialists, a referral-based specialty hospital serving the needs of small animals, offering diagnostic tools and treatment options not typically found outside veterinary teaching hospitals, including orthopedic and neurologic surgery, oncology, dermatology, dentistry, ophthalmology, internal medicine, and more, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Mmm.